Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're really excited to have our special guest uh, who we collaborated with over the weekend to host the um, online conference on the Holocaust. Turkey also here tonight with us, and we're really fortunate that we record everything. Dr. Mehat Bosa, who is an assistant professor of English in St. Stephen's College in the University of Delhi. Uh, Delhi. She's one of the board of directors and the head of Global Holocaust and Religious Studies at the Global Center for Religious Research in Denver. And she, not too long ago, completed her PhD entitled Literary, Literary Representation of the Holocaust and Assessment, which is, uh, I mean, quite a hefty volume of sorts. You can read it, you can work out with it. I mean, there's a lot of weight in there. And a tremendous reach in terms of what she's covering all the way really to the kind of the studies of the changing nature of anti-Semitism into the modern period and then the tracking of Holocaust literature all the way into thinking about Holocaust remembrance beyond in terms of the kind of our new digital environment, games and so on and so forth. So there's a tremendous kind of uh, range and also curiosity behind all of this. Her primary interests are Holocaust genocide studies, Jewish studies, gender identity, trauma studies, and PTSD. While her training herself is in literary studies, she is really wide-ranging in terms of the ways in which she conceives of her own research. She has presented her research at the Ackerman Center. It should always be at the first line of your research, right? And your CV for Holocaust studies at the University of Texas in Dallas, as we know, and the Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania. We actually met at one of our annual scholars conferences. In 2019. 2019. See, you know this better than I do. <laughs> Our translations have been published in Purple Ink, the online journal of Brown University, Los Angeles, and on the creative front, her short story and several poems have been published by Visual Verse in Travail Review. Um, she has many other kind of activities, is commissioning editor of Strive Block and Journal, uh, Department of War Studies, King's College in London. She is an online moderator um, mm. on a kind of game Holocaust. platform um, that Ah, here it goes on. See, copy editor of the Journal of International Women's Studies, peer review, language, literary, interdisciplinary studies journal in India, a moderator, this is the one that I had in mind for Holocaust and computer games, editorial board, member of Digital Holocaust Studies, member award, nomination committee, contemporary literary review. And she just did her PhD in May, so God knows how the CV is going to look like in another year's time. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. So, <clears throat> hello everyone, and I would still say greetings from New Delhi, India. Foremost, I extend a heartfelt thanks to Dr. Romer for having me here and giving me the opportunity to present. A big thanks to Cindy and Bonnie for handling all the Herculean technicalities behind this seemingly seamless process. And also thank you for Dr. David Patterson to just be here and with his blessings. So my... <sighs> Presentation today is concerned with creating awareness about the Holocaust education in India. And for this, I have structured my presentation into two parts. The first part would be covering the current Indian scenario of the dissemination of Holocaust education as it exists today. The second part will focus on the intersections between India and the Holocaust, something that has stemmed out from my own experience as a researcher as well as an English educator in the University of Delhi. Now, as I embarked upon my doctoral research, one of the fundamental questions, apart from my research questions, that I began with was, why the Holocaust? Why should I be devoting a considerable period of my life to something which did not directly affect my country? And here I stand after four and a half years of research. I can state not one, but a kaleidoscope of reasons some of which also overlap with the education guide list provided by the UNESCO in 2018. Now, teaching about the Holocaust demonstrates the fragility of all societies and of institutions that are supposed to protect the security and rights of all. It makes one aware about the susceptibility of scapegoating, the potential for extreme violence and the abuse of power. It further demonstrates the dangers of prejudice, discrimination, and dehumanization, be it anti-Semitism that fueled the Holocaust or any other forms of racism and intolerance. Lastly, 
It also deepens our reflection about the contemporary issues and broadens our understanding towards it, towards issues that affect societies around the world alike, such as mass violence, power of extremist ideologies, and propaganda. In my thesis conclusion, while discussing the importance of Holocaust education, in the light of anti-Semitic events of the 21st century, I discussed the status of its dissemination in the Indian scenario. Unfortunately, there does not exist a proper channel in India through which Holocaust education can be taught. <coughs> and Presidency University in Kolkata is the only university in Asia where the subject is being offered in the list of core courses. The indifference towards this Holocaust education that prevails in India can be attributed to four major reasons. First, the alienation effect. With Europe being 4,000 miles away from the Indian subcontinent, the Holocaust is viewed as an event of a far off land and is thus regarded as an alien isolated event. The distant geographic locale is thus accompanied by a lack of empathy. Second, and the most important one, the overarching shadow of the Indian partition. The Holocaust years were also the time when India was steeped in its own freedom struggles. But the freedom revolts gained momentum specifically during the years 1944 and 1947, during which it in intensified. And in India was again steeped in a battery of rebellions. So the revolts ranging from the RIN, that is the Royal Indian Mutiny, in 1945 to 46, the violent upsurges in many states of India were accompanied by communal violence. It is these events that overshadow the catastrophe of the Holocaust. And more so, the partition of India is sometimes also referred to as Indian Holocaust. And thus, we have books such as The Holocaust of Indian Partition, Bengal's Hindu Holocaust, which kind of describes the case of vanishing Hindus from Bangladesh. The Holocaust in the Raj, Raj meaning rule. So it talks about the great famine in which millions perished. Not only books, we have pictures entitled India's Secret Holocaust, The Forgotten Indian Holocaust, and The Original Holocaust further accompanying the notion of equating the Indian partition with the Holocaust. And as you can see, it says, lest we forget the original Holocaust. And the original Holocaust refers to the Indian partition. The third reason can be attributed to the Holocaust being mentioned as an oblique reference in the school textbooks and also as an optional course in the universities. The National Council of Educational Research and Training, the NCERT, is an autonomous body that is responsible for designing the curriculum from classes 1 to 12 in all subjects. So it's kind of a standard textbook. The NCERT textbooks, they are prescribed throughout the Indian schools. The class 9 social science textbook has an entire chapter of over 100 pages devoted to Nazism. But the word Holocaust, as you can see, is only mentioned thrice. Once in the headline. Another, it's described as the Nazi killing operations, also called the Holocaust. That's all. So the Holocaust has a diluted introduction that strips it off the seriousness associated with the sinister evil. Not only this, but the image of Hitler is presented as a neutral image. He is presented as a powerful leader, passionate about restoring the dignity of the German nation to compensate for the losses of the First World War. And it said, Hitler was a powerful speaker. His passion and his words moved people. He promised to build a strong nation. This is how he is described. And then, the new words are often attributed to the side boxes. And here you find the new word, called concentration camp. And look at the description. It says, a camp where people were isolated and detained without due process of law. People, generalized. Typically, it was surrounded by electrified barbed wire fences. So there is no particular reference to Jews or the group. It's just a general 
sweeping statement. And one needs to understand that it is these students who enter the university level teaching. So it's very difficult to deconstruct that image of what they have read. Likewise, the Delhi University Master's Celebi has an optional course entitled Violence and Memory Studies. It's an open elective course, but firstly, it depends on the number of students taking up that course, which is very few, because the students are inclined towards other optional courses, which seemingly seem more interesting, which include Dalit studies in India, visual studies and disability studies. Secondly, out of the four units, only the first unit deals with the Holocaust. That also through just one memoir of Primo Levi. Even the secondary readings, suggested readings are all focused on the partition of India. And lastly, the indifference towards Holocaust education and awareness is fueled by this overarching, empowering image of Adolf Hitler. The name Hitler is now used casually as a brand name for anyone who behaves in an authoritative or dictative manner. The name Hitler is also a common trope in Bollywood. Bollywood is the Indian cinema. So in Bollywood movies, it's a common name and also in the Indian soap operas to depict a commanding protagonist. However, the fascination of Hitler goes beyond this. And so, we have an ice cream brand and a cloth shop named after him. When the owner of this Hitler ice cream stall, Neeraj, was interviewed, he said he had an uncle who was strict and authoritative like Hitler. And he loved his uncle, so he decided to name his shop after him. Unaware of the murderous legacy that the name carries. Such is the captivating image of Hitler that in 2018, Mr. Naramali Sir Prasad, an Indian film actor turned politician, attended the parliament dressed up as Adolf Hitler to show his indifference of opinion with the other members of the parliament. And when he was questioned about his choice, he said very proudly, what I'm doing will grab attention more quickly and make people think. Not only this, we have a pool parlor in Nagpur called Hitler's Den and a cafe called Hitler's Cross named after the dictator. In all these pictures, we find that there is a vilification of the swastika. The swastika insignia, it has been transformed from a symbol of reverence into a symbol of hate. So what you see on your left is the traditional insignia of swastika which is a symbol of good luck and prosperity and has four dots within each of the four arms. The four arms signify the sacred texts of Hinduism, which are Rig Veda, Atharved, Samved and Yajurved. And the four dots in a circular or a chronological order, it means right thoughts, right words, right action and right understanding. And look at how it has been transformed into a symbol of hate. The admiration for Hitler is also depicted on car stickers with the labels of Schutzstaffel and the images of Hitler. And if this was not enough, there is a website called Colorpur that sells Hitler merchandise. And apart from t-shirts, jewelry boxes, keychains and locks, the best selling ones are the cover cases of all brands of cell phones. In addition to this, the sales of Mein Kampf have shown a steady rise in India. In 2011, it was ranked as the number one best selling book on Amazon India. Out of the 22 official languages of India, Mein Kampf has been translated into more than 14 languages. The most popular one being its Hindi translation. Hindi, the national language of India. In 2021, around a thousand copies were sold. 
And again, if this was not enough, we also have comic books that have made their way into bookshops. And they are placed at par with the revered characters from the religious texts and along with the famous personalities of India. Thus, one can see that this overarching, empowering image of Adolf Hitler is driven by ignorance and indifference. What is surprising is that nothing much is being done to invert this perception. People continue to hail his name, ignorant of the murderous legacy that he carries, and they're just happy branding their products because it garners them ma massive attention. Creating awareness, thus I feel, is the need of the hour, and it thus becomes pertinent to view Holocaust as a transnational phenomenon. And this brings me to the second part of my presentation. One of the reasons behind the Hitler cult that exists in India is the belief among the Indian nationalists that Hitler wholeheartedly extended his support to the Indian freedom struggle. In August 2021, Weber Purandare, a journalist and historian, published his book, Hitler and India. And this is the first book that debunks this notion of Hitler being friends with India. The book begins by describing the fates of Indians, particularly journalists, in the Third Reich, who are imprisoned in February 1933, a month after Hitler ascended to the position of chancellor in Germany. The book is a result of his painstaking portrait and is among the first ones to analyze Hitler's outlook on India and its people. And you also have a quote which says, the Indians can think themselves lucky that we do not rule India. We should have made their lives a misery. So it is the very first examination of what India meant to a figure who, in a perplexing paradox, remains quite a sensation in our country. As an English educator, what I have seen is that university students are ignorant of the Holocaust, and the only thing they are familiar is the diary of Anne Frank. Even when they read the diary, they read it as a teenage diary, while being completely oblivious to the entire backdrop. Hence, there is a need to sensitize the students that would help foster empathy so that the Holocaust would not be viewed as an alien event. During the last year of my research, out of curiosity, I found a few interesting examples, which I believe can form the relevant entry wedges for creating awareness regarding Holocaust in India. And the first example is of Maharaja Digvijay Singhji Ratan Singhji Jadeja. Maharaja means prince, and he was a Maharaja of Gujarat, the then British rule, who in 1942 gave refuge to 1,000 Polish Jewish children. And therefore, he's hailed popularly as the Indian Oscar Schindler. He not only gave them refuge, but also hired teachers to, to educate them, and also a Polish chef, because the kids, the Polish kids, were not used to having Indian spicy food. And to honor him, there is a square in Warsaw named after him. Now, since the pronunciation of his name is quite a tongue twister, so it's simply called the Square of the Good Maharaja. In addition to this, there is also a school named after him. Next example that I could gather was of Princess Noor Inayat Khan, famously referred to as the Spy Princess or the Indian Spy Princess. A descendant of Tipu Sultan, who later on became the most celebrated British spy and fought against the Nazis. Now, Shabani Basu, in her book Spy Princess, provides a very realistic account of Noor's life that differs from the previous romanticized versions. So in my interview with her, she revealed the tedious journey of obtaining information about Noor's life. Born into a conservative Sufi family, Noor, with her courage, tackled the cause of the British as well as of Indian independence. Next, a recent database of the USHMM, Washington, D.C., shows yet another connection. A lady named Louise Angel, born in Bombay, India, was interned in Drancy and then deported to Auschwitz with her son and exterminated in 1942. 
Now, being a relatively new addition to the database, it will require some time to trace up her entire trajectory and connection with India. Another welcoming step that was seen earlier this year was when the Yad Vashem held a certification training program only for Delhi University professors in order to familiarize them with the Holocaust. And I was fortunate enough to attend it. And I hope that this is just the beginning. Along with such training programs, I see the above examples as entry points that could be explored further for creating awareness regarding the Holocaust in India. And it would thus save it from becoming a passing reference in the Indian curriculum. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Questions. Questions, comments? Uh, yes, uh, during the years that, uh, in the 40s, as you mentioned, especially 44, 47, the uh, people of India were in a serious conflict with the British. Yes. And before that. Well. Even before that. How does, how does the conflict with the British affect sympathy for the Nazis who are the enemies of the British and the Indian people are enemies of the British. Mm. This, and yet they don't have a, it's, I, I, I'm guessing, you tell me, is it difficult for the Indian people to see the British as liberators of tyranny in Europe when they're experiencing the tyranny, that they at least see it as the tyranny of the British in India? Yes. It's, how does that complicate the perception? One thing that um, complicates the perception is that, again, the image of Hitler being friends yeah. with, uh, and that is because of this one figure called Subhash Chandra Bose. So he was a freedom fighter in India who uh, went to meet Adolf Hitler and you have exchanges between Hitler and again, you have exchanges between Hitler and Mahatma Gandhi as well. So. This thing complicates the figure. And then um, another reason I would think that, um, yes, you're very right that it complicates the things, but this is what needs to debunk. And uh, this uh, journalist, Vaibhav Purandare, talks in detail about this in his book. And he says, it's, it's the time that we debunk this notion and let's not consider Hitler friends of Indians and let's not consider that he extended his support wholeheartedly. Whereas what he says about Indians is completely opposite when you hear his conversations and epistolary exchanges with Subhash Chandra Bose. So yes. Hello. Hello. Is it difficult for you to enemy It can be, yes. The enemy of enemy is a friend, yes. In India, there were pockets of uh, places that Jews went for refuge. Mm -hmm. And there is a population of yes. Jewish Indians. Yes. How is that handled today with this education, with the learning about the Holocaust? Is that put a spotlight? on the Jewish Indians, mm -hmm. and how you, how you reached out to them for uh, anything. Mm -hmm. So in India, you have these pockets as you referred to. There is Cochin, there is Kolkata, there is Goa and Bombay. So at present, we have like 4,500 to 5,000 Jews in our country. And Delhi has, of course, two synagogues that are considered the oldest synagogues. So um, I did not reach out to them, but um, in that uh, particular states, Holocaust education is a slightly bit more sensitized and prevalent than in the other states. And that's the reason that Professor Navra Safridi teaches in Presidency University, Kolkata, and has the population of Baghdadi Jews. And it's the only Asian university which offers that course in the core syllabus. Rest is all optional. Those Jews came uh, before, before the war or after the war? During, during the war and some before the war, yes. So India quite provided, India was kind of a haven for them, for refuge. 
So that is what interested me in the last year of my research that there has to be some entry wedges so that I could teach, I could take up this course. And um, it would like, the students are like not empathetic with the um, legacy of the Holocaust. For instance, when I teach a Merchant of Venice and the character of Shylock. So for me, somebody like me teaching that line when Shylock says, I am a Jew, if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you spit on us, do we not get hurt? So that line sums up like the entire, it, it's loaded with background for me, but not with the students. They just laugh it off and said, say, is that even a thing to say? Of course, they would be hurt because they are humans. Yes. So, um, for the average Muslim, like, university kids, how would you say, um, like, the Azad thing, Um, I didn't get you. Could you repeat it? Yeah, so uh, the Indian National Army, the Indian 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 Army, the Again, in the history department, you have this entire book by David Thompson, if I'm guessing it right. Again, it has skipped off the end. It has Nazism, but it has skipped off the reference to the Holocaust. So it's entirely like the Indian partition and reference to the Nazism, skipping off Holocaust. Yes. Um, just to comment and a question, the, in terms of the various entry points, there's an interesting book by a British scholar, Brian Shayette. Uh, we wrote a book about what's called Diasporas of the Mind. And in it, he tracks the biographies of a couple of German Jews who initially um, escaped Nazi Germany to England, and mm -hmm. then moved from England onward to India, and kind of end up um, in the middle of the partition and write okay. about it. So that may be like an interesting another way of thinking about it. But my question is, um, you know, what, what you presented is, is, you know, to say it's disheartening is probably an understatement, but what I'm surprised about is to see that when you think about Holocaust or Holocaust education, mm -hmm. that there doesn't seem to be any presence of the wider kind of national, transnational Holocaust mm -hmm. remembrance. I mean, yes. you reference Yad Vashem, you reference Hollywood, but how about Hollywood? I mean, there got to be some kind of <coughs> influx of Hollywood produced Holocaust movies in India. Mm -hmm. Or not? I mean, that's my question. Is where is the where is what everyone else is doing going to India or not? Is, is there any kind of presence of these movies? There is, but not prevalent. Okay. It's just a handful of scholars who watch them, but not the common crowd. And also, I feel that India has still not signed up the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. So that is one important step that is lacking in our country. And moreover, I mean, I was asked this question that why uh, the books are titled Indian Holocaust, why the term Holocaust is there, because when you read the books, there is no reference to the Holocaust, it's just about partition of India, and that's it. So, interestingly, I, I read up an article by Dovid Katz, and it says, now we have come to, Hol I mean, Holocaust denial, etc., all these terms exist, but now there is a new term which is gaining impetus, which is Holocaust theft. So you steal the title and you just put it up with no knowledge of it. Can I follow up with one other question? Yes. Um, just in terms of, so a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, the Ackerman Center ended up partnering uh, with quite a few Chinese organizations um, in town. And this, you know, started out by our founding director, Zhuzhan Asha, being invited, particularly on the occasion of commemorating the end mm -hmm. of the Second World War. And that started a longer conversation how within the Chinese community there had not been a real tradition of remembering yes. Nanjing and how now, however, living in the United States where the remembrance mm -hmm. of both the Second World War and the Holocaust was so prevalent that they became more interested also of recalling the massacres of Nanjing. So flipping around, is there a difference when it comes to the Indian communities in the United States? Are they relating to the Holocaust? in a different way when one does in India? 
Definitely, Professor, because they are getting more sensitized towards the topic than Indian students are. Is that another way, maybe how some of the Yes, maybe, yes. Yes, sure. sure. Yes, Professor. Um, I was in India a few years ago at a university for a conference on uh, genocide, Holocaust, and mass murder. And uh, I'm just purely anecdotal, just a brief experience on campus, but I noticed uh, a noticeable level of anti Zionism. Oh. Is that typical or not typical? No, it's, it's not typical, yes. In Delhi University, it's not so. There might be a, like in other universities, but here in, it's not so. Yeah. The comment that you made. That the Indian students saw Hitler as some sort of strong leader. Mm -hmm. This is also something in the Chinese universities. Okay. I just recently read a book written mm -hmm. by an American professor who had taught in China. Okay. And when she asked the question about Hitler, mm -hmm. the student said that he was a great leader. They did not see any evil associated with it. Yes, yes. So it's a very wide problem, and to see that we are bringing it from the students in India is very troubling. Yes, and there's a wonderful article uh, written uh, which says how India and China explain the Holocaust. Mm. So they also bring up this that you mentioned. Yeah, sorry to jump in with a question. Is there anything on other genocides? Other genocides again? Armenian genocide? No. Yeah. You're still in books, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I want to go ahead with the earlier question. Did you ask if you have said how Hitler was considered as a culture in most of Charles and Leo? And in national opinion, if you refer to the national government, because I think it was like in China, which is different. Um, what I get from your question is that is it harder to? Yes, with the yes, it is yes, yes. In fact, um, if you know this person called Gregory Stanton, he talks about he has a website like Genocide Watch, and he talks about ten stages of genocide. And he has very correctly said, if uh, Indian scenario doesn't change, India will witness a genocide within four years. So he particularly talks about the government that is prevalent in India. I wouldn't go into deep because then it would raise up controversial topics. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, of course, we have the National Archives of India, which are full of databases and which are full of, like they're accessible and one can easily access those and we, I mean, again, it boils down to one thing that how far would the Indian curriculum be willing to do that? more questions or comments. I mean, other kind of interesting side, which this is a change between Gandhi and Martin Buber. Martin know, Buber, yes. Um, if you want to speak a little bit to that. I've not researched much in detail, but yes. Um, this is a question as to what well, Gandhi seems to be advising German Jews uh -huh. to oppose Hitler by um, copying essentially the model of civil yes. obedience. Yes, civil, civil disobedience, yeah. So, now, you know, usually, you know, because on the he's, side of Holocaust and German Jewish studies uh -huh. attracts a certain amount of attention. Because whenever we speak of Mahatma Gandhi, he's associated with ahimsa, that is non-violence. Mm -hmm. 
So he suggested that to Martin Buber, and we have this epistolary exchange between them. What are some of the things that you are considering to do next in promoting this education? Um, see, firstly, it requires to reach that level of position where you can design the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we had this meeting earlier this year with the delegates from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and UNESCO Paris. And uh, we had a discussion regarding what changes can be brought in. And after a long, lengthy discussion of like three or four hours, they suggested we can sort of uh, have this national project going on in India, which would take again a couple of years, that would create awareness regarding the Holocaust. So that's one thing, one possibility that I see. The second possibility that I see is that we need more translations. Yes. We more translations of the Holocaust memoirs or texts and to reach out to the masses. Because these Hitler Hitler's autobiography, Mein Kampf, is available just for like peanut money. And everybody can afford it. Just like dimes. Unfortunately, not much better in this country. Oh, uh, that thing is also quite popular now. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because a lot of the college students that are reading mm -hmm. see him simply as a, not even as a historical figure, but as a character. Mm -hmm. And so they do not see the series. Yes. And it's a lousy book. No, it is. Very confusing. Yeah, uh, poorly done. Even in casual remarks, uh, you can be called, oh, stop being a Hitler. Thank you.